So, Danian, thank you so much for being on my show. I'm so excited. I couldn't wait to talk to you. I've read your books. I couldn't wait to share your message with more people. I know so many people know who you are, but for the people that don't, I just want to tell them a little bit about you. Um, Danian is, you are, a New York Times best-selling author and acclaimed international speaker. You're also a leading expert in end-of-life care and uh, grief and a driving force in integration of complementary and allopathic medicine. And then you have a non-profit organization which is called the Twilight Brigade, which we're going to get into a little bit later on, where you train um, volunteers to be a loving presence at the bedside of those in transition. And you yourself has a, have accrued over 32,000 hours at the bedside of these people, which is incredible. Um, you've also authored three books and, uh, and are actually almost about to release the fourth book. Where, um, with, I know, we want to talk about that later. It's so exciting. And I know that you've co-authored these with your wife, Catherine. And we're going to touch a little bit on each of these books, if that's okay. So, thank you. And something that you say, um, which you say, there's no such thing as death. And I love what you say. You say, you know that the world can be transformed if we all understand we are great, powerful, and mighty spiritual beings with dignity, direction, and purpose. Love that. Goosebumps. That's goosebump stuff, love. So welcome and thank you for being here. And yeah, but also, also thank, thank you for having, having me, Wendy. Wendy. And thank you for being brave enough to step out in the world and begin to make the difference by creating your show and having me on your show. <laughs> well, you're welcome. So can you share with us a little bit about your life before your first death experience? Well, before the first near-death experience, I grew up a tough guy. You know, I played sports, served in the Marine Corps. I worked for various government agencies, and I thought the way you dealt with all your problems was to hit it in the face <laughs> and then watch its reaction. And so I come from the deep south. There was not uh, – I couldn't very, get a very good concept of what religion was because – where I come from, everybody goes to hell. And so I just never bought into what we now call fundamentalist religion. And so I uh, did not discover, I don't think, uh, Wendy, I've ever discovered religion, but I did discover spirituality. And so this is the person I was until one day I was talking on the telephone and people say, well, Daniel, you're so very important that I always say, how important could I be? God called me on the telephone. <laughs> and so I, I discovered that not only is about 95% of everything you've ever been told about yourself, about 90% of everything you've been told about the world you live in, and about 100% of what happens after you leave this world is basically a lie. So the thing that I try to get across to people is just that. There is no such thing as death. Religion is basically a series, a system of control mechanisms based on something you don't know that is inevitably going to happen. You will leave this dimension and go to another dimension. But death, death is a ridiculous concept. To even think death is ridiculous. It will never happen. Wow. Well, in your first book, Saved by the Light, which you've sold over 20 million copies, I mean, that's unbelievable, you really talk about in detail what happened to you and where you went. And can you please tell us a little bit about this experience? Well, I, we got to remember this, Wendy. I was never in any mindset. There was no such thing as the near-death experience at the time that it happened to me. Dr. Raymond Moody had not given it the name the near-death experience. And so I had no background no insight, no possible thought patterns about how it would work before it happened to me. 
and when I was struck by lightning, there is a very natural system by which you leave this world. And I, you have to remember, I was burning, I was on fire, and I was paralyzed. And it was like battery acid. I was burning over and over. And then all of a sudden, I lifted up my body. I was completely at peace. I felt very safe and comfortable. I moved down a tunnel. I came into this place of brilliant, beautiful light. I, I, it was as though I knew this place better than I had known any other place I'd ever been. And I had what I think and believe to be the single most important event that people can take away from the near-death experience. The panoramic life review. You will see your entire life pass before you in a 360 degree panorama. You will realize that you have missed absolutely nothing. And you have restricted your life into certain categories so that you could teach and learn certain lessons that you had decided before you came to this life. I mean, well patterned. You see yourself, the second person point of view is if you were your own best friend watching you. So you would say, wow, Dan, that was really smart. Whoa, Dan, how could you be that stupid? <laughs> and then you literally become every person that you have ever encountered. You become them. And you, refuse, you feel the direct results of your interaction between you and every person you've ever encountered. What it makes you really conscious of is never what you've done, but why you did it. And then at the end, and I think the most important, Wendy, fact is this. And I'll use the term God. If God could not come today and God sent you, in the life you just reviewed, what difference did you and God make? That is what changed my life. That was the one point in all of this that made me stop and think that I am a co-creator. I am a great, powerful, mighty spiritual being with dignity, direction, and purpose. But what that also means is this, Wendy, so are you. And so is everybody who's listening to this broadcast. This is who you are. You choose to come, and you chose to come, and you have a job and a mission that you very rarely ever fail. So you, after this experience, you have no fear, no fear of death because you don't believe in death, no fear of anything. You just, you have complete faith that this is correct. I base my life totally on how entertaining anything is. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it's got to be entertaining, or you know, or I have, I don't care. You know, what are you going to do? Kill me? Well, that's funny. Because <laughs> that's more fun. You know, yeah. I mean, like people say, I had a guy tell me because I'm getting a little age on me. A guy, he says, he says, you know, God, I'm just getting, the, I'm another day older. I said, well, I'm another day closer. Wow. There is no such thing as death. It's a stupid, stupid concept. And when you, when you stop long enough, Wendy, to think about where we are in quantum physics, what you call quantum physics, I have learned more about the dignity of our spiritual identity from quantum physics than anything any religion says or talks about. We are energetic, spiritual beings. And we have to accept that. Yes. And so talking about these spiritual beings, you, you speak about this in your, you actually wrote a second book about, um, called, uh, let's see, what was your second book was? At Peace in the Light. Right. And, well, and you speak about the boxes of knowledge that you received from these 13 beings of light. And they made these predictions, something over 100 predictions. And this was in 1975, which is a long time ago. So much has changed since then. And some of these predictions you share have, well, most of these predictions have come true. 
can you well, share just a couple of these predictions with us um, that have come true that seemed really strange and weird and you had no idea what they meant at the time? I never knew, Wendy, that these boxes of knowledge, these are what I call them, that these boxes of knowledge were prophecies. I never knew that. I mean, I never knew anything about the near-death experience. Where I made the mistake was I talked to Dr. Raymond Moody about these events, and he categorized them and put them in a catalog, and it was four years before the first one happened. And what he did was, I told him that uh, I told him about Chernobyl, the uh, the event that happened with the uh, nuclear nuclear shutdown in the Ukraine, and I told him that it would lead to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Okay, it led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. I talked about war, which came became Desert Storm. I talked about all the horrors that were going to happen in Croatia and Serbia and this, that where it would be horrible. And this is one of the funny ones. Uh, I kept thinking that the a president of the United States, because I kept seeing these letters R, 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 and I kept trying to figure out that it was going to be some act. So I decided that the next president was going to be Robert Redford. It turned out to be Ronald Reagan. But so, you know, some of those things in the early days, Wendy, how I interpret them and tried to understand them have changed because I have a broader range some 40 years later. But I said that they would become something called an environmental religion. And everybody thought I was crazy, okay? Because an environmental religion means that we would have to return to being pagans. Because the whole crux of religion, especially the Holy Roman Catholic Church, was that paganism, Mother Earth and Father Sky, was completely wrong. And then the Hebrews' uh, problems with, the, uh, with Canaanites, the Canaanites were pagans. But now we have this thing called global warming. And we have the Pope involved in global warming. We have the World Council of Churches involved in global warming. We have literally every known religion involved in global warming. And now we are about to have a environmental religion wow. where all of them are coming together. We sit at the precipice this day and it will be determined by April, sometime in mid-April in 2017. We will be on the road to world war or world peace. We right now sit on the precipice of a world war. And why? Because you have the Russians, the Chinese, the Iraqis, the Iranians, the uh, Turks, all the old empires, the Chinese, all the old great empires, the Persia, China, America, are all in Syria today fighting. And you see where jets are bomb scraping jets and passing each other. When people don't really realize this, we sit here today, one wrong move by the Americans, the Chinese, the Russians, by the Iranians, the Iraqis, the Turks, one, and now the British back in Afghanistan, one wrong move, and we have a world war today. So what people need to do is they listen to this. Let's take a deep breath. Clear their hearts, open their minds, and be really sane. We do not need, I read a, a report this morning that the Germans are preparing to create a defensive posture against the Russians. Now, that gets pretty scary when you start to think about it. But what's amazing is these decisions are all in our hands. So you're saying we can and faced with this choice, are we all faced with this choice right now to prevent 
We are there now. And we'll and for the next year, we will go back and forth. People have to become very, very wise. And they have to be smart about what they're doing and what they're choosing. And they have to look at their life in a way that what spiritual purpose can they see as opposed to what mental, physical idea, identity are they using? And this is, I want to tell you something funny. Uh, someone sent me a joke. And it, it was these two UFOs in space and they were talking to each other. And one said, look, the humans have developed uh, nuclear space stations. You know, we have platforms, satellite platforms with nuclear weapons. He said the humans, earthlings, have developed nuclear uh, space platforms for weapons. And the other uh, alien said, well, let me ask you, does that seem like they're becoming a very intelligent group? The other alien says, I think not, because they're pointing the weapons at themselves. Now that's funny. That's funny, but it's scary. That's scary. <laughs> but it's where we are. We advanced to the point where we can destroy each other and we are threatening each other, one little small planet, and we're threatening each other with annihilation, which annihilation would be complete destruction of all of us. I think it's crazy. It is crazy, but if enough people get your message and enough people have to make the decision to follow the spiritual path, you be safe. This doesn't have to happen. No, it doesn't have to happen. There was nothing ever carved in stone. And what's really important is like you stepping up to the plate, Wendy. You opening up and putting your gorgeous self on the air and you creating a program where people get a chance to make a choices and they get a chance to be influenced. We do not have to be where we are. We are choosing a selfishness and nationalized identity. We are all members of the earth. And I, I'm not so much for one world government and all that stuff that we hear about. But we're all a part of each other. We're all a part of a whole consciousness and we are connected with each other. And when people who've been through what I've been through, this is what we all say. We know that we're oneness. We know that there is a oneness that connects us. And I hope it's in love that if you look at your hand and you imagine it's another person, do you love that hand or do you not? And that's how you have to look at it. I like that. That's good. So, so I want to just go back to your experience, and you, you know, your recovery was so painful and isolating. And this, like you said, it was way before Dr. Raymond Moody and his, you know, even talking about near-death experiences. So, how did you release the anger that you felt, and the, you know, and get through the pain of this experience? How did you keep the faith? Well. It took me two years to learn to walk and feed myself. And the only thing that kept me going was I had seen a reality so powerful, so wondrous, and so loving that whatever I had to face being here, by staying here, whatever it took for the reasons for why I was back here, it had to be worth it. I was angry I was angry for what it took, and I was angry at people because they all wanted me to go back to being somebody that I used to be instead of who I was becoming. They would rather have that ass, that jackass, than the person that I uh, was looking at religion and paying attention to all these, these spiritually connected things. And so by, you know, you once you know that this is silly. This life is just an, a hologram. You're not really here. I mean, when I tell people that, you know, I laugh and I say, okay, let me tell you something. You have begun to, you have all got so crazy 
that you think you are here. Listen to this, Wendy. You never leave heaven. Never. We're still there. We have projected ourselves into this hologram. Now think about this. All the people in America, they say there's 320 million people in America. If, and everybody's made up of atoms, molecules, and cells. Okay? If you took all the empty space out of every atom in every body of everybody who lives in America, it would be 94.6% empty space. If you took all the empty space out of every molecule in every body, in every, in every body, in every person in the United States, it would be 98% empty space. If you took all the empty space out of every cell, of every body, of every body in the United States, it would be 99% empty space. So if you took all the empty space out of every cell, every molecule, and every cell, everybody in the United States, 320 million, we would all fit in a regular size matchbox. So where do you honestly think you are if that's the absolute truth? Wow. And think about that. Think You're not here. You're, right. You're you projected yourself into a hologram, and science now has proven unequivocally that we're all energy. Well, everybody's just energy. <laughs> Well, let me ask you this question. Well, if you know, saying that, and you know, and um, listening to what you're saying, why do we come here then? What's the reason for us coming to this place to to, suffer? to learn to co-create? We all come here to be co-creators. Think of this. Think of everything that you think that God can be: loving, caring, protective. Uh, good friends, creative, birthing, giving, creating life, everybody can become everything that they can think that God is or hope that God is in their life by being in human form. You can plant a garden and feed yourself. You can give birth and raise a child. You can be caring. You can be loving. You can be protective. You can be thoughtful. You can be all those things. So at certain, this is my theory. At a certain point, you have achieved a goal so unfathomable that you earn the right to enter this plane of existence so that you can practice being godlike. You can practice caring. You can practice hoping. You can practice being protective. You can practice growing your own food. You can practice giving birth. You can practice becoming a parent. You can care. You can be everything that God is. You can be on the television, watching television, or be on the internet, and see somebody in trouble in real time. Television and the internet give you the same vision that we think God has. You can care about somebody in Haiti, and you can take your credit card out, and you can do something about helping them. Sure. That is what this life is about. That's miraculous. And so this is why we all come here. Yes. I think your dog agrees with us. Your dog's talking. Uh, she... talking. <laughs> she wants to be part of the show. It's okay. Hello, Lou. We love it. She's a great, but she's the greatest. <laughs> what we do is we go to, we go to uh, death row. Uh, we go to death row, yeah. and that means that those puppies that have one day, yeah. and then they euthanize them, they euthanize them, and we get a couple. Wow. Well, you know, we get them and we bring them home, and this is the thing that we do. We bring them home and we take them as our children, and Boo is a, uh, 
I don't know exactly what she is, but she's one. Her name is Boudica. She's named after the, the warrior priestess of uh, Italy who defeated Henry, uh, Prince Henry of Germany sometime in 1300s. So we named her Boudica. So we called her Boo. Well, so I love that you do that. And of course you do that. So this is a good time to talk about the Twilight Brigade. Can you um, tell us why you co-founded it and you know what what is it? Well, here's what it is. We're all going to be hospice volunteers one day, sooner or later. You're going to be a hospice volunteer for yourself, for someone you love or someone who loved you. Religion is so ill-prepared. Uh, science is so ill-prepared. Medicine is so ill-prepared. We must learn an art form that teaches us to first find closure, facing it ourselves. And the, and the reason why I created the Twilight Brigade is so that people could face it themselves. And I trick them into believing the facing it themselves so they can be at the bedside of someone they love, to know the right questions to ask, to know the right, the right creation of conversation. How do you create the conversation that instills and facilitates closure? We all need a pathway to closure. And most people want to talk about the weather. Well, people lying in a bed with just a few days to live, they don't give a damn what the weather is, Wendy. They don't care what the temperature, they're not going outside. They need to be able to talk about the things that they're going to go through, and they need to be able to talk about the things that's gone on in their life so that they can find closure in the life they live, but also they can leave a sense of themselves with people who've been trained in the Twilight Brigade. Anyone can go to thetwilightbrigade.com. We're all over the United States. We have trainings all over the United States. It's a it's a 20-hour uh, course. You have to take it, and I just do it all in one weekend because I want to meet and exceed the standard necessary for all people to meet and reach the, the quality as a as a certified hospice volunteer, caregiver. And I think it's this. If God couldn't come today, and God sent me, in the life I just reviewed, what difference would God make? There is nothing that I could be better at than being at the bedside of those people who are about to make a journey to some place I have already been. I know what to ask. I know how to bring them to that place to face things that they haven't faced, to make the right call for forgiveness, to make the right call to give forgiveness, you know, so that they know that this life had closure and joy in transition. Wow, that's so powerful, and it's such good knowledge. People are, like you said, scared to talk about death, scared to talk about dying, and we are not prepared. Even if somebody has died, a lot of people feel awkward to even mention it and say, I'm sorry, or, you know, they don't, they, there's no guidance on that. So what you do is incredible. And, and it's well, I'm just why I, do these, why I do these shows. I need people, look, I'm just a guy, okay? I mean, I'm not, you know, there's nothing special. Like when people say, Daniel, you're so special. I know too much about me to be impressed, <laughs> but, you know? So I, I don't. You know, that's just not a place that I go, Wendy. You know, I don't buy into all that stuff. Fame and fortune and, you know, life is good to me. But I'm just not like that. I'm an everyday guy. I don't, I have been three times to a place that everybody's eventually going to go. And I see it as a responsibility to be the person that I am, far from perfect, but a lot smarter than I was in 1975. And to be able to come forward and give people a place to take a good look at what they're going to have to deal with. And here's where it gets really critical. If you were born between 1940 and 1967, most of us will be leaving in the next 15 years. 
So the average life expectancy of a man is 75.4 years, a woman 81.2 years. How many people who are watching this broadcast right now know somebody near 75 or near 81? Okay, when you start to think about that, we will lose roughly 15 million people in the next 10 years that are friends, relatives, parents, brothers, sisters, aunts and uncles. Are you ready to deal with that? I know the answer is no. So the Twilight Brigade is my way of trying to give back and to honor people in such a way that they can prepare and be able to help those that they love at the time when they most need to be able to make sane, loving, critical decisions. Well, I, mean, I found that so comforting, and I hope that everybody listening you know, looks at your organization and you said it's uh, birthtwilightbrigade.com. I'm going, to, I'm going to post all your contact information on the bottom. Please. Thank you. But also, I know that you and your wife, Catherine, are getting ready to release your next book, and it's called 10 Things to Know Before You Go. So can you just share one of those things with us, something or something that you think is you know, profound and powerful that you have learned at the bedside of somebody who's in that transition? Well, here's the most important point. You know, if you know me, everybody knows I make fun of just about everything because I always say, what are they going to do, kill me? Well, big deal. Who do you think that scared? So when we did the trilogy, Saved, Peace, and the Secrets, that's enough about death. It's about life. How do you live this life? And so uh, Ken and I were talking, and we said, I came up with this idea, 10 things to know before you go. And it's about this. When you look at this reality, what's the number one cause of death in America and most other countries? People start to think about it. That's the first page in the book. You turn the page and it says, no matter what you thought, birth is the number one cause of death. I love that, because it's true. Yeah, birth is the number one. You turn to the next page and it says, remember, if you're breathing, you're leaving. And if you just took a breath, this book is for you. And what I do is I explore all the things that you deal with. A human being does two things for two reasons, gratification or preservation. You're either trying to gratify yourself or you're trying to protect yourself. You have to get past those first two things before you start to look at your spiritual identity. And so I go through what I realize and look at are the spiritual identities of a person, and I tell them the way, uh, I mean, I don't speak American, I don't speak English, I speak Southern American, but I do it very proudly, you know, I would never change a single syllable, because, you know, if I get it, anybody can get it. And so I go through each of these steps of what you need to look at. And mostly I make fun of everything. You know, nobody can do anything to me. And so when you start to look at the 10 things you need to know, you need to know that you are a great, powerful, and mighty spiritual being with dignity, direction, and purpose. That means there's only one thing that can ever go wrong. Only one thing. You have allowed based on either gratification or preservation, allowed something to affect your dignity. Wow. While you're trying to gratify yourself or protect yourself, you've allowed something to affect your dignity, which affects your direction and skews your purpose. And the whole book is about this way to back engineer looking at your life to see how you got so crazy. By, by not paying attention to what you've allowed to affect you. And the last page on the book, it says this. It says, remember the meaning of life. Aspire to inspire before you expire. Wow. That's 
that's the key. You know, and I, I, I believe I've talked enough about being dead. I want to talk about being alive and how to get the most out of being alive. You know, you look at gratification and preservation and you move into the side because that's how you get into trouble. Because we, because of free will, we think we can push either one of those to a certain limit, which causes us to get ourselves into trouble. And then that affects, then that affects our dignity. And then we become subject institutions, governments, regulations, and fear. And I want people to move past that because I watch what what the things that we've grown to trust, religion, institution, and government. Who in the world trusts their minister? Who trusts their banker? Who trusts the government? Who trusts anything anybody says to us? So I figured that this book, Kat and I talked about it, this book would be the best way that we could open up our hearts to people and give them a guideline, a, a tour through life as they face that how they got into this was either trying to gratify themselves, pleasing someone else, or how to protect themselves and usually harming someone else. And there's where all the problems start. And, I mean, you, nobody has better credentials to write this than you, besides that you have actually died three times, been to the other side three times, and been at the bedside of these people in transition for 32,000 hours that you've told 30, 39 years of hospice volunteer. I mean, the things that you've seen and the experiences that you've had, Danny, and thank you for sharing them with us, because this is... I've seen it all. Important information. I think you have. <laughs> I think you've still got a little bit more to go, love. It's still more well, <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I wake up every day excited. I mean, I still have problems from the lightning 40 years ago. I mean, it did a lot of damage. But, you know, uh, Catherine is like Dr. Mom. You know, she's always figuring out ways and looking at ways and making me do certain things so that I, I extend this life when I don't, you know, it doesn't, um, I don't care. But you know what? I'm appreciative with you because I see things that people do and I hear things that people say that a simple statement for me that can, a simple statement or a viewpoint of mine can change their whole view their whole attitude toward what they're dealing with. And that I have no problems with over there, quote unquote. I'm just as comfortable. I have as many dead friends as most people have living friends. <laughs> yeah, I have plenty of friends over there. And I, I, you know, it's odd to sound, but I talk to them. I have visitations from them. They come and give me insight. Because there is a frequency and a place because mine does not have fear. I'm comfortable. I have a technique to enter and to speed my vibration up. They have to slow their vibration down. I speed mine up. And we have we have get togethers. It's like a family reunion. I love it. So so actually then can you can you just share with us you know you you said that you were given a directive to open up these healing centers talking about frequency and getting into a different realm and um so when when you first died they had um, given you this directive to open up these healing centers um where are you with those right now have you um, opened it i'm ready it's now i knew it would i i thought it would take 29 years because Electronics had to reach a certain point. You had to go from analog to digital. I had been building this equipment since 1977. I recently had some uh, some people, uh, this world famous Japanese master, trance master, go you know all that teaches all those sacred uh, whatever they teach in Japan. 
and then a psychiatrist from Romania and a lawyer for the government uh, come to go through a program. I always just laugh because I've been doing this since 1977. And it wasn't wasn't until between 2014 and 2017 that I would bring them on the earth because the electronics would be up to date. I have to modify the equipment, but I'm capable now because of digital. And you have to use digital and analog, which is the old way as opposed to the new way, and they have to mesh because digital is direct and specific. Analog has wavelengths in it. And so you have to create a wavelength so a digital frequency can cross into it and enter into the wave so that you can harmonize with that other world and that other world can harmonize with you. And it's only been in the last six years that we have advanced technologically to where what I saw to do, we're capable of doing it. So. I'm exactly 99.99%. I experiment on people and laugh at them over and over again because when this great Japanese swamp, he, uh, he brought nine of his pupils. When he got out of the system, it was really funny. They're all paralyzed by what he's saying. Of he he went to Venus. Wow. And watch this. And he was describing the people who live on Venus and how thin they are. They're not like us, but they're people and their cities and their uh, landscapes. And you could not tell this guy he didn't go to Venus. Wow. And these these guys, all these guys that were with him. And they're all looking at me, and I'm just laughing. I said, listen, I have had people talk to their mothers, who's been passed for years, their fathers, their sisters, their brothers. Here's one of my best ones. I had a guy, he was 78 years old. He was an international banker. Hardcore New York Ain't no retentive. <laughs> you know, New York said it all. That's it. And I mean, you know, God. So his children came to me. He had quit speaking to his children. And one of his children, because I've gotten to be reasonable friends with the guy, and it's because we like some of the same things. And they asked me that uh, would I talk to him? I said, sure. You know, and he came, and I said, look, let me just put you through the program. He went through the program, and when he came through it, you know, I have a before and after. You start some one place, and then you come back to that same place. So, you know, you see the distance that you found, okay? I ask you the same 12 questions before, and then I ask you the same 12 questions after. And when you listen to what people say before, and then you listen to the answers after, it's the most exciting thing. And so he never said a word. And he said, and he relaxed, and he said, I think I'm going to go home now. He goes home, and about two weeks later, it was Thanksgiving. He called all of his children, hadn't spoken to them in six years, and asked them to come for Thanksgiving. Well, and he was pleasant, nice, talked to the kids. He wasn't mushy or over, overwrought, but it was the first time, and they had such a good time. And all of them came to my house, and they said, what in the world happened? Well, I knew what happened, okay, because when I ask you the same 12 questions, it doesn't matter. I pick up what goes on. You know, I'm very empathic about that stuff. And I said, listen, I can't tell you because you never betray that. And they said, well, we're going back home and make him tell us. I said, okay, no skin off my back. 
So they went back home and they told their dad that that they'd come to my house and I would not tell them anything. And he just smiled. And then he said, let me tell you what happened. I saw your mother. And she had passed away. Uh, she had passed away six years ago. And she was a raging alcoholic. And he, she had humiliated him so much in the business world that he, every time he saw one of his children, it reminded him of her. She came to meet him, and they talked, and they found resolution, and he had met, and he told him, I met with your mother. She was so she was beautiful. We talked. We found resolution. We found peace. And I no longer see each of you as her. And that's why I invited you for Thanksgiving. Now, when you can do that, and this has happened with me a hundred times, stuff like this. I mean, this guy going to Venus didn't mean anything to me. <laughs> I don't care, you know? got some Japanese swami going to Venus and having conversations with Venetians. I mean, you know, hey, that's all right with me. Yeah, but the, I, but what you did for this man and his family and the way they're able to move forward with their lives and if their grandchildren involved, and I mean, that is where the power is, the love. You know, that's it. Yeah, I mean, this whole program, I, I created this program for two reasons. Number one, for people facing it, when you're when you're diagnosed and it, the dance is over, you're palliative. Then maybe there's a program, and I think that this is what this program will be, that you can come and see what's next. And not be scared. And so you, yeah, and you don't spend your life being terrified and yeah. trying to babysit everybody and you know take care of everybody. You know what's next, or. A person who's lost someone, especially if you've been the caregiver, because you lose a little of you each day as a husband takes care of a wife, a wife takes care of a husband, a daughter takes care of a, a mother, these kinds of issues, and you didn't have a chance to have closure or resolution. Then this is what I want for you. Come over. You can go visit mom. You know, let's go ahead and have those real, true, not horrifying goodbyes, but that peaceful, loving vibe. Because that world, to me, is as easy to get to as going to the grocery store. I, I, you know, I can watch where the astrology is. I can watch, I can watch where the sacred geometry is. Everything is about breathing. Everything has. There's two things that people have to do. They have to pay attention to their breathing, and they have to pay attention to their listening. If you can breathe and you can listen, I can get you there. Wow. Well, I mean, I'm going to, as I said, put the contact information for anybody who wants to try this, which is incredible. They should contact you directly. But I do want to touch on something else before you go, and that's your cruise. I know you and Catherine are planning a cruise. What is that cruise in October this year? <laughs> Well, what we do, Wendy, we love cruises because you take the hotel with you. Okay. And this is called Cruise in the Spirit. I know you're going to put it up. But there's probably 30 really great speakers, very diverse and very uh, every sort of mindset. And we love them. We love to go on them. Because when you get out in the ocean and you smell that fresh salt air and you're going through a program and you, you can see the stars, you get a chance to refresh yourself, you get a chance to renew yourself, and you get a chance to see all these people you see on television or you go to a lecture but you can't get near them. Because Kat and I, we're out all the time. You can see us. We're sitting, we're sitting by the pool. And we're always outside so people can interact with us and we sit and we talk. And I, the people that are on this cruise, I don't really like most of them. 
have a good relationship. And they're not all Catherine and Damien. There's every kind of subject matter, and it's inexpensive, you know, because I won't be a part. I I want stuff that people can't afford, you know, because we take less money than most people because I want people to be able to afford it and be able to, to participate and to come. And everybody needs a break. You need a break, and you need to come where the hotel is, pay, is paid for. It goes with you. The food is paid for, and you get to eat fabulous meals. And we do small ports. You stop. I have a big issue about being on the water because you keep expanding. And then you walk, you put your feet on the ground, and put you, you we're in the, we're in the Caymans. I mean, we're in the, uh, in the Caribbean. And you walk off, and you put your feet in the sand, and you connect to the earth again. And you send your love to the Schumann resonant 7.2 hertz, and you feel that rush up into you. And then you explore, and then you get back on the ship, and you go at it again, more information, and you look at the stars, and you take a dip in the pool, and you eat fabulous food. So I, I really enjoy boat cruises, and I enjoy the, the camaraderie between the people who come to see me come to see other people. And I learn a lot of stuff myself. I mean, it's not all me. I learn and we learn and listen to what people are going through and it, it makes us better. Well, you know, I, I've learned so much from just this interview with you. And I know that you also have a membership on your website. And I want you to tell everybody, you know, but just how they can get hold of you directly on that website. Well, they just go to DanielandCatherine.com and sign up. All the details are there. And what it is is every month I have a thing called That Ain't Nothing, which is if you're from the South, you know that means it is something. And I look at, I look at world affairs, and I have an opinion about it. And I look at it from a spiritual – I'm quite knowledgeable of world affairs. I've been in 94 countries. And I am an old combat marine, and I understand see spiritual slants. Then I take the boxes of knowledge, and I take the insights from boxes of knowledge, and I give people ways to observe the world they're looking at. We have a guided meditation. We have a thing called spirit tips. I mean, we just finished recording one. You can see it behind me. Spiritual politics, because we're now in an election year, and it's spirit tips. And it's a unique, unique way that once a month you can come into our world and you can get a guided meditation that you can listen to all month. You cut it on, you take a point, you go through it, you listen, get that tranquility. You get to listen to me rant and rave, you know, and then we have a blast from the past, some insanity I did or something sane that did, so people can come back and look and listen remembering an event or the interview we did and so that people who miss something come back and I think it's like our family I mean we have a pretty good size membership and I'm thankful but the more people who come the tighter the family becomes and the activism that we you know we ask people every month to do something and in the course of doing that, they know that there's another seven or eight hundred people doing the same thing that they're doing and are participating in it. And that collectively we're making a global effect and a global shift and a conscious change. And like they say, it only takes 3% to make the difference. Wow. Well, Damien, you are so fascinating and your story is remarkable. And I just, I really, Thank you for having the courage to live your life and share this journey with us. I have enjoyed every minute of speaking with you. Thank you. For okay, well, let me say the exact same thing about you, Wendy. <laughs> you are marvelous, fabulous, beautiful. It, I've been amazed by every word you said. And I'm glad that you're brave enough to step back out here and go to making a difference in the lives and the world of people and that you're courageous 
to do it and don't stop because we all need you. Thank you, Dan. And, and if I ever come to Yankee Land, I'll be looking you up. And I'm coming to visit you in Vegas, love. I'm coming. Come on down. We'll be, we'll, we'll sit by the pool and laugh and tell each other great stories.